Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, hope everyone had a happy holiday and well, it's maybe a bit late to talk about the holiday now, but uh, anyway, uh, we haven't seen you in forever. So <laughs> uh, good to see you all again. And uh, today we're, we're uh, lucky enough to have uh, Sarah Arpin giving us a talk on orientations and isogeny graphs. So Sarah is, uh, is a postdoc at the University of Leiden and uh, and she'll be she'll be introducing this topic. I guess for the first time we're really talking about this in the Isogeny Club, so that will be it will be fun. Oh, I think you're still muted, Sarah. By the way. Ah, yeah, I just couldn't find the controls for a second. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, so thank you very much, uh, Jonathan and Krein, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here speaking about uh, orientations for the first time and isogeny graphs, of course. Um, this work is joint work with uh, Mingji Chen, Kristen Lauder, Renata Scheidler, uh, Catherine Stang, and Ha Tran, and it's coming out of a Women in Numbers 5 collaboration. So Women in Numbers, if you haven't heard of it, it's a great uh, series of workshops, and there are many small collaborations uh, going on at a time. So there's uh, multiple Women in Numbers 5 collaborations, but I will use Win5 to refer to uh, my group. So just a little overview of where we're going. I'll give you some motivation and uh, background, and we'll talk a little bit about the class group action, uh, which I'm not sure has been looked at too much during these talks. I'll define orientations, and then we'll talk about applications of um, algorithms on oriented isogeny graphs to finding cycles and paths in our usual uh, isogeny graphs. So I'll start out with a reminder of a familiar friend, right, our super singular elliptic curve L isogeny graphs. So pictured here is the directed two isogeny graph over FP bar for P equal to 179. So you'll see, um, you know, a few familiar friends there, 0 and 17, 28 causing some issues with the uh, matching up of isogenies with their duals, but um, the graph structure here should be pretty familiar, I think. Our um, vertices are labeled with J invariants, uh, which denote the isomorphism class of the elliptic curves uh, that we're sort of representing at those vertices, and the arrows are directed to isogenies here. So this particular prime I've chosen is pretty small, uh, maybe smaller than you're used to, but we'll take a look at a larger prime uh, in a bit. Uh, also, we have the seaside isogeny graphs. So these are isogeny graphs over FP, uh, with the curves being defined over FP in a particular class, which we'll look at later. And uh, typically, we look at multiple prime degree, small prime degree isogenies with these graphs. Uh, but we can already note a striking difference, right? You kind of see a nice patterned regular behavior of these graphs uh, compared to the super singular uh, L isogeny graph over FP bar. So uh, for the description of the hard problems here, uh, I have a super singular two isogeny graph over FP bar for P equal to 1009. You'll notice here that the edges are not directed, so I chose the prime P accordingly, that I can take the edges to be undirected and match up isogenies with their duals. I've just chosen uh, numbers from zero on to label the edges, or sorry, to label the vertices here because uh, there are many vertices over FP squared, and I didn't really want to write all of that out. Um, but just as a reminder, these graphs do look quite uh, messy when we let P grow. So 1009 is not a particularly large number, but already we see sort of um, a, a messy graph, right? It, it would be hard to navigate without some sort of uh, tool for finding these edges. Uh, so the pathfinding problem, I'm has been discussed multiple times, but just to recall, uh, given two random vertices in this graph, finding a path 
of L isogenies that connect those two vertices is a hard problem. Uh, and in a 2018 paper by Eisentrager, Hallgren, Lauder, Morrison, and Petit, uh, this hard problem was related to other hard problems in isogeny graphs, in particular the endomorphism ring problem, another hard problem here um, can be translated to finding certain small cycles in the isogeny graph. So uh, the pathfinding problem and the endomorphism ring problem are uh, hard problems I'll focus on and I'll sort of view the endomorphism ring problem via cycles in the L isogeny graph. Um, so these were our two motivating questions for starting this work that ended up uh, splitting into two papers. Uh, for the first one, we notice that there's a structure when you add orientation, so we'll, we'll add that uh, definition later, to the information of an L isogeny graph. And can this structure allow us to navigate and pathfind between vertices in our usual L isogeny graph? Uh, so this question resulted in our first uh, paper out of this Win5 collaboration, orienteering with one endomorphism. And in this paper, we provide explicit algorithms for using orientations to pathfind. Um, another question is that of cycles in oriented isogeny graphs. So we'll, we'll look at those. They come up quite naturally. Uh, how can we relate them to the cycles that we see in the supersingular L isogeny graph? And this uh, bijection, it ended up being a bijection when you define these terms very carefully, uh, ended up being our second paper, Orientations and Cycles in Supersingular Isogeny Graphs. So I hope to discuss both of these topics and explain all of the words around uh, these two topics as well. So a quick aside, uh, I wanted to talk about the class group action way of sort of choosing uh, isogenies from a starting elliptic curve. Seaside uses this class group action on their particular collection of FP curves. So assuming Seaside conditions on the prime P, they consider this particular set of elliptic curves, which is just picked out by this one um, variable A, taken to be an FP, uh, and then they vary that uh, where E ends up being a super singular over FP. Uh, so X covers all of the FP isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves with this particular endomorphism ring over FP. So as we know, our usual endomorphism rings that we're considering for super singular elliptic curves are quite ugly, right? Maximal orders and quaternion algebras, non-commutative things. But if you're only looking at the endomorphisms defined over FP, you can generate that ring uh, by Frobenius, basically, so the Frobenius endomorphism. Um, and in particular, your endomorphism ring is either going, your FP endomorphism ring is either going to be Z adjoin square root minus P or uh, Z adjoin one plus square root minus P over two. So these are quite uh, simpler <laughs> endomorphism rings to deal with. The class group action of this order has uh, an action that we can define on the collection X above. And basically using the class group, we are choosing a particular endomorphism of the curve. Um, or sorry, we're choosing a particular isogeny of the curve. So when you take an integral ideal, and you can always choose an integral representative from whatever uh, class group you are working in, you can take the intersection of the kernels of all of the endomorphisms in that ideal. That will give you a finite kernel with which you can define an isogeny. So we define the action of the class group to be this isogeny's action on the curve. So our curve E gets taken to E mod this kernel, and we call that the action of L. So it's non-trivial to see that this is actually well-defined, right? That if you take two ideals from the same class, you'll end up um, on the same codomain curve. Uh, but with all of this sort of given, 
I, uh, I, I implore you to read the Seaside paper for more details of this. They go into this in a lot of detail. Um, also, the ideals that they're working with in Seaside are chosen uh, to have a very particular form. So it's well understood what these ideals are going to look like. This is very nice. Uh, in the Seaside case, this class group action is free and transitive on the particular set X that they're working with, which free and transitive, that's very much what we like in a class group action. So to extend this idea just a little bit, I can look back at our full endomorphism ring of a super singular elliptic curve over FP bar. So now I'm allowing uh, the entire maximal order in the quaternion algebra, but I can take a subring of that of that maximal order, uh, which is a quadratic imaginary subring. So a subring that comes from an imaginary quadratic field, something similar to right our uh, Q adjoined square root minus P. Uh, it doesn't have to be that though, we're generalizing a little bit. And I'll consider this set of curves over FP bar that contain that particular imaginary quadratic order inside the endomorphism ring. I'll consider that up to FP bar isomorphism for the moment. The class group of O now also acts on this set of super singular elliptic curves. And the ideal action is actually the same. It's just a little bit trickier to see that this is a, a well-defined class group action, um, that it's well, uh, well-defined on the set SSO that I've written down for you there. And the free and transitive part certainly gets a little bit tricky, so I'm going to put this on hold until we can talk about a certain subset of SSO on which this action is going to be relevant. Okay, so moving on to the orientations part of the talk. Think of an orientation on a super singular elliptic curve as being partial endomorphism ring information. So you're getting the information of an embedding of an imaginary quadratic field into the endomorphism ring of the super singular elliptic curve. This idea was sort of um, made popular by a preprint of Colo and Kohel in 2020, in which they proposed an a cryptographic protocol that used oriented isogeny graphs. So this was called OSIDE and it came out at a NUTMEC uh, conference in 2020. And everyone was very interested in this idea of all of this added structure. It sort of seemed um, vulnerable, right? Uh, I think it was proven to be vulnerable later. Um, but the idea of adding orientations was certainly uh, a novel and interesting and to study on its own. So the uh, relevant papers here, and I have these slides online. I'm not sure if anyone can repost that in the chat, uh, but they're available for you to click as links if you'd like. Uh, the relevant paper is there and the Onuki paper, uh, which sort of closely followed the appearance of Colo and Kohel's original OSIDE paper, uh, refined and um, went into more detail of the proofs of the structure that Colo and Kohel were using in these isogeny graphs. Thank you. So to describe these orientations, uh, we're just taking an imaginary quadratic field and embedding it into the endomorphism algebra. In particular, you can look at what the image of that embedding is inside the actual endomorphism ring. So not tensoring with Q, not looking at it in the entire quaternion algebra, but what part of this imaginary quadratic field lands in the endomorphism ring of E. This will end up being some order, right? The sort of pre-image there is going to be some order in K. And we'll say that the K orientation is a primitive O orientation if the image of O is um, exactly what we see of K inside the endomorphism ring of E. So I'm thinking of attaching to E all of this information iota. Iota can basically be specified by sending the generator of O somewhere to the endomorphism ring of E. So that's what I'm thinking of when I say that these orientations are partial 
uh, endomorphism ring information. Yes, Pierrick, uh, yeah, thank you for posting that vulnerability of oocyte. And yes, so for our example here, I'm taking the endomorphism ring of a supersingular elliptic curve over FP bar for P179, not one that you might be familiar with, right? Because it's too easy to look at 1728. So uh, 22 uh, has sort of unfamiliar endomorphism ring. Uh, there is an embedding of uh, Q adjoin I into the endomorphism algebra of E22, uh, I being square root of negative one, uh, given by sending I to I. However, ZI does not land in the endomorphism ring uh, of E22. Uh, Z adjoined 2I plus Z does. So this is an example of where you see a non-maximal order being the um, order with which an orientation is primitive. Uh, we can also define a conjugation action on these orientations. This will be very important for the technical details of working with orientations. Uh, yes, I guess any questions from the definition? Uh, this part is main, maybe the part that might be new. Okay, we'll keep going. Oh, where is there? Yeah. Ah, okay, so with these new objects, uh, E together with an orientation, so an oriented, K oriented supersingular elliptic curve, uh, we want to be able to look at how these objects play with isogenies. Um, are there graphs? What do they look like? These sorts of things. So when you have an isogeny of an elliptic curve, you want to see what that isogeny does to your orientation information. In particular, you want to be able to define an orientation on the codomain of your isogeny phi. So phi here is a, an isogeny between E and E prime, right? E prime is my codomain. And I have an orientation on E, I want to define one on E prime. So that is our phi star iota here. And it's defined by basically transporting your information back to the orientation that we have on E. So phi hat, that's our dual isogeny. Uh, that takes you back to E. Uh, on E, you have information about embedding uh, imaginary quadratic field elements into your quaternion algebra. So you do that there, you end up with an endomorphism of E or something in your quaternion algebra, let's think of it that way. And you can transport that information back to E prime by then composing with phi. So we change degree here, which is perhaps not ideal, but then uh, we correct it by dividing by the degree of phi. This is all being done in the quaternion algebra where we've tensored with Q. So of course, uh, this object one over the degree of uh, phi exists. So there are sort of, there are three possibilities for what has happened uh, to the orientation when you do this sort of transport process. If you start with a primitive, uh, primitively O-oriented supersingular elliptic curve, you're going to end up with an orientation on E prime, which is primitive with respect to some order of K, but it's not necessarily the same order of K. So it could be that it is indeed the same order, and in which case we call phi a horizontal isogeny. Uh, it can be the case that the O prime that you end up being primitively oriented with respect to is contained and uh, properly contained in O, in which case we say phi is descending, mm -hmm. or it can be that O prime properly contains O, in which case we say phi is ascending. You can check which case you're in, uh, basically by finding the order that you're primitively oriented with respect to and, and checking its index or its conductor. Um, with this notion of an oriented isogeny, so an isogeny between two oriented supersingular elliptic curves, 
Uh, we also want to define a new notion of isomorphism. So before we were just using the FP bar isomorphism mm -hmm. that we have on our elliptic curves, but we now want our notion of isomorphism to extend to the supersingular elliptic curves with their orientation. So E iota and E prime iota, uh, prime, sorry, the typo in that should definitely be a prime on that second iota. Are K isomorphic if there exists an isomorphism from E to E prime such that uh, the induced uh, orientation is iota prime. So this new notion of isomorphism on oriented elliptic curves. Uh, and just I want to point right back to the language there, horizontal, descending, ascending, that is uh, sort of visual and descriptive knowledge that we will uh, use when we describe these graphs. So moving forward to oriented isogeny volcanoes, once we have orientations, we have vertices, uh, or I guess once we have K isomorphism classes of uh, oriented elliptic curves, we have vertices. And once we have isogenies, now we have edges. Uh, the structure of these oriented supersingular elliptic curve isogeny graphs is very different from either of the graphs that we looked at before, honestly. Uh, what happens with these is, well, they do have the volcano structure that I've alluded to with the horizontal ascending and descending terminology there. Uh, but these volcanoes are different from our FP volcanoes. Of course, they're not just uh, rings in this case, uh, but they're actually infinite. Uh, so you can continue to descend using descending isogenies and primitively orienting with uh, higher and higher conductor orders. Uh, so just to give a visual feel of what we're looking at here, I have uh, ellip super singular elliptic curves over FP bar with Q adjoined square root minus 47 orientations. I didn't um, write comma iota for each of these vertices, but uh, just remember that the vertices here are oriented super singular elliptic curves. And this is the two isogeny volcano for this uh, oriented picture. Uh, the rim vertices have a primitive orientation by the maximal order in this particular case, and then descending to what we would call uh, altitude one, uh, and then descending altitude two, uh, sort of alluding to mountains and heights and things like that. Uh, we have primitive orientations with respect to orders which are index two and then index four uh, going on so far, um, going on down infinitely far. So the fact that we have all of this structure, this volcano structure of the oriented super singular elliptic curve isogeny graphs uh, is really important information that we can use on our usual super singular isogeny graph. In this next picture, I have a comparison of that first two isogeny graph for P equals 179 with the same volcano that we had on the previous page. Uh, again, it's an orientation by Q adjoined square root minus 47. Um, and the rim order is the maximal order in that number field. Uh, I've extended it a little bit so that you can see that we do, in fact, cover the usual isogeny graph and I have only extended in the directions that I need in order for you to see all of the vertices uh, but just highlighting that this cycle at the top of the oriented isogeny volcano it is indeed a cycle that we see in the super singular two isogeny graph uh, the curves that are collect, uh, connected to that cycle in the super singular two isogeny graph are again, of course, connected uh, to that those curves in the oriented picture, just with different orientations now attached to it. And I can continue to plot the, this graph with orientations being induced by two isogenies uh, descending down the rim of the volcano. I will repeat back on the vertices that I've actually already colored in uh, purple and blue and green and so on and so forth, uh, but with new orientations. So that's the repeated vertices that we'll see 
on the uh, oriented isogeny graph. Uh, yes. And let me move to the next one. Yes. So I'm hoping that these oriented isogeny graphs will become a sort of third category of favorite graph uh, for you. And just to overview the structure that we have here, uh, the vertices on the rim have a primitive O orientation where O can be an order of conductor, which is relatively prime to L. So in the picture that we were looking at, it happens to be a maximal order. That doesn't need to be the case. It could have been an order of conductor three, which is co-prime to our isogeny degree, degree of two. Um, as we move down the sides of the volcano, we are increasing an index in the rim order, so by L at each step. Something that's sort of strange to deal with is there can be multiple volcanoes of O-oriented curves. So instead of having all of the supersingular elliptic curves, which have orientation by, say, the maximal order, of Q adjoined square root minus 47 being on the rim of a single volcano, it can be split up between uh, the rim of multiple volcanoes. Uh, and we, when, we, when we have that case, we can refer to the collection of those volcanoes as a cordillera. So this um, volcano terminology is sort of borrowed from the ordinary elliptic uh, elliptic curve isogeny graph uh, picture and I believe volcano uh, terminology was first mentioned by uh, Fouquet and Morin. Okay so now to talk about a little bit of the technicalities that we have to deal with if you want to prove anything about going back and forth and between oriented isogeny graphs and super singular isogeny graphs. Uh, so this first line is, is definitely the very technical bit. Uh, we are going to fix an extension of K uh, in which there exists a prime P above P such that every elliptic curve with CM by O has a representative over L prime with good reduction at P. Uh, such a curve exists and you can see the proof of the existence of this uh, finite extension of K in uh, standard arithmetic of elliptic curves text. Uh, so using this L prime, uh, which when you when you see an L prime, you're probably thinking, well, where's mm -hmm. L? Uh, I am sweeping it under the rug and uh, leaving those details to the to the proof in the paper. But there is an L. Um, we'll just worry about the L prime. And with this L prime in mind, I'm going to give you two new definitions. So sort of refining the definition uh, SSO that we had before, where we were looking at super singular elliptic curves that had uh, O inside the endomorphism ring. Now I'm looking for ones which have sort of exactly O inside their endomorphism ring. So curves with a K orientation, which is primitive uh, with respect to the order O. And that is taken now up to K isomorphism, now that we have this notion of isomorphism classes of oriented supersingular elliptic curves. LO, which I'll, I'll pronounce the E-L-L-O as L-O, is a collection of elliptic curves over L prime. So thinking above, uh, above the, or unreduced, right? And these are curves with endomorphism ring precisely O, which have good reduction at P, which is our prime above P um, chosen carefully before. Uh, these are up to isomorphism. So sort of a classical fact that the size of LO is equal to the class number of the order O. And then another sort of technical bit if we normalize with respect to the invariant differential, we can make a unique choice of primitive O orientation for the reduction of E in EAL uh, O. So that's a little uh, second bullet point there. I probably should insert A for the reduction of E. And tilde is what I will use for the reduction. So we're defining a map from LO to these primitively oriented supersingular elliptic curves, O primitively oriented supersingular elliptic curves. Um, 
And this map has a lot of interesting properties for us to use. In particular, it's injective. Uh, when P is ramified in O, the image is precisely uh, the set of primitively O-oriented supersingular elliptic curves. And remember that if we're even sort of talking about this situation at all, you might remember that for an imaginary quadratic field to have an embedding in a quaternion algebra, you need P to be not split. So this leaves us with either ramified or inert. And in the ramified case, okay, the image of this map is precisely uh, the collection of curves we want. It turns out if P is inert, then it is not ever going to be equal to the entire uh, set. Um, maybe for some small prime, but I don't think so. Um, but we do know a little bit about how that works in that case as well. Uh, for any given orientation, oriented super singular elliptic curve in SSO primitive, either that curve, or that oriented curve or its Frobenius conjugate is in the image. So we know that sort of up to Frobenius, we're catching everything in the image of this map row. Uh, and sort of the exciting bit now, returning to our class group action, taking a super singular elliptic curve with primitive O orientation. You can take an ideal of O, which is co prime to P. Uh, you can always choose that uh, an ideal representative of any ideal class to be co prime to P and integral. And you can define a subgroup as we have before uh, using the orientation information, mapping the ideal into a you know, collection of generators uh, by endomorphisms. And we can define an isogeny with this ideal. So we've described this before in general. Now we're going to be doing it particularly with primitively O-oriented elliptic curves. Uh, the class group action is similar to what we've seen in other cases, but in, in this case, uh, and Onuki proved in uh, his work in 2021, that the action of the class group of O is free and transitive on the image of LO, so the row image of LO. This allows us to walk the rim of our oriented super singular elliptic curve isogeny graphs. So in particular, this rim we've put up before, you can find the isogenies that will take you around the rim as opposed to descending, right? There was uh, also one two isogeny that was descending from each of these rim curves using the class group, using the ideals above two. Uh, when you conjugate the orientations on the vertices, uh, that also gives you this action in the same direction, but by the uh, other ideal. So two splits in OK and um, the, well, you make a choice for, for one or the other. And uh, the L2 that I've chosen above here, the L2 bar is the one that takes you in the same direction when you're conjugating your vertices, uh, your vertex orientations. Okay, so that brings me with sort of enough information to talk about comparing cycles in the isogeny graph with uh, cycles in the oriented isogeny graph with cycles in the usual isogeny graph. Uh, the green rim that we've looked at before, again, same uh, orientation here, corresponds to the green cycle that we see here. Ah, oops, I think this should be the larger O. Oh, sorry, the should have been OK. Uh, so this correspondence is a little bit tricky. And in particular, we want to refine our notion of cycle. So in graph theory, people use, it seems to be uh, one definition of cycle. But since we're isogenists and we sort of care about backtracking along duals and we care about automorphisms, uh, we needed a more particular definition of isogeny um, or of isogeny cycle. So in the paper that we sort of worked with, uh, we define an isogeny cycle to be a closed walk. We forget base point. So 
no longer care where we start, which is uh, again, a big difference from graph theorists and uh, no backtracking, right? No consecutive edges that compose to multiplication by L. So if you do have multi edges, then sort of backtracking is a lot, right? If you go on the other edge and we also don't want to count uh, cycles, which are just powers of other cycles. So in particular, if you have a three cycle, you cannot use it to create a six cycle just by going around twice. And with this particular definition, we were able to prove a bijection between the rims of oriented isogeny volcanoes and the cycles uh, in the L isogeny graph. So if you fix uh, length R, I think for us R, we wanted to be greater than two, um, are in bijection with the directed rims of length R and the union of all oriented super singular L isogeny volcanoes over FP bar up to conjugation of orientation. So the map from the volcano rims to isogeny cycles is simply forgetting the orientation. The map from the isogeny cycles back to the volcano rims, uh, you walk your cycle and you obtain an endomorphism of a particular elliptic curve. You can then transport that to the uh, endomorphism algebra and think of it as generating an imaginary quadratic field inside of your quaternion algebra. The vertices with extra automorphisms provide difficulties because uh, of course they do, <laughs> in particular isogenies with J equals zero and 1728 as codomains. So these ones were particularly tricky to deal with. And uh, the way we walk around this issue is by making a careful choice for each of these such isogenies called a safe arbitrary assignment. Um, and I will leave the details of that to the papers. But here, for example, you can see we took cycles of length three, four, and five in the two isogeny graph um, for P equals 179 uh, so over FP bar. And we generated endomorphisms using those walks. And those endomorphisms corresponded to imaginary quadratic orders. Um, so I also have this picture for uh, six cycles. So there were multiple uh, walks of length six in the two isogeny graph for um, P equals 178. And these walks generated these different orders. So you'll notice that the uh, conjugation, or sorry, the P power for Benius um, actually ended up generating the same order. So this walk uh, and its P power for Benius variant uh, generated the same imaginary quadratic order. And you'll also notice some interesting things. So here, um, these two walks, the starred walk here and here, they are not distinguishable just by J invariance, and that's because they contain curves with extra automorphisms. Uh, so Although we cannot tell these two paths apart just by the labels of the vertices, we can make a choice for one of them and then distinguish the other one from it. Uh, so that's basically the, the idea behind the safe arbitrary assignment is sort of choosing um, a map or a, a post, or yeah, basically a map into O and using that as your base point for sort of deciding whether or not you've also post composed with a different um, with a different uh, automorphism. So it's not a canonical choice, but we still do have a non canonical bijection, which is important. Or we still do have a canonical bijection. Okay. Um, so pathfinding with this information. Uh, we know that we can walk to the rim by making choices for our isogenies, which will lead to ascending. Uh, for uh, just a particular note here, 1728 appears at altitude one of this oriented isogeny volcano, 
and we have a certain way of navigating and figuring out which of the three two isogenies from 1728 will be ascending. Uh, we've also talked about using the class group to walk the rim so we can find all of the vertices on the rim. Putting those two pieces together, we can find paths between uh, supersingular elliptic curves in the L isogeny graph. Uh, so this idea uh, we sort of had simultaneously with Benjamin Wozolowski, who also has a paper on certain reductions uh, between problems and pathfinding. And our paper in WIN5, we provide sort of the algorithmic perspective. For, so how you would actually um, do this in Sage, for example, and we have code for it on our GitHub. Uh, but these were sort of independent projects that uh, happened uh, nearly simultaneously. So to talk a little bit about this walking to the rim process, process um, if you're starting at a super singular elliptic curve, which is not primitively oriented with respect to a sort of rim order, you can figure out which isogeny you should walk, uh, you should walk along in order to ascend the volcano. Uh, the process for that sort of looks like this. Um, you figure out the number of steps to the rim pretty quickly by figuring out, okay, I'm primitively oriented with respect to this order, and uh, that's index however much in the um, L fundamental order O at the rim. So you then need to translate your orientation in such a way that when you choose the right isogeny to walk up, you actually end up being able to walk up. So this ends up being a sort of a translation process, basically uh, adding or subtracting a constant uh, to your isogeny or sorry, to your endomorphism in order to make it suitable for this process, sort of this transfer process. Uh, after that translation, you can figure out which, uh, which what the kernel will be of your ascending isogeny by just looking at the kernel of your uh, resulting suitable endomorphism and taking a point that is also in your um, in your L torsion points among your L torsion points. So this will generate your ascending L isogeny phi and you compute your re resulting orientation. Uh, you repeat these steps until you have ended at a rim curve. There's explicit code for this on our Win5 GitHub, uh, so you can find it's in Sage. The classical pathfinding algorithm is basically a way to uh, put this together with uh, walking to the rim from two curves. So in order to do this and find a path between two vertices, uh, you do need to start with some information on one, right? You need to start with an orientation. Uh, then the other curve should be one whose endomorphism ring you know, and then you can find an orientation with respect to this imaginary quadratic order. So we, uh, in all of the code, we use 1728, but any curve that you know the endomorphism ring for, uh, would work just as well. Uh, so given our super singular elliptic curve E over here with the orientation information, we provide a classical algorithm for the L isogeny pathfinding problem. So finding a path from E to 1728 that is sub exponential in log P times a class number relating to uh, our, our endomorphism theta. And depending on assumptions that you make about the discriminant of the order with which E is primitively oriented with respect to, this algorithm can be polynomial time. So, of course, this just confirms what we know, which is uh, curves with small endomorphisms or known small endomorphisms are uh, pretty dangerous. We also provided a quantum algorithm for this pathfinding pro problem using the algorithm of uh, Childs, Zhao, and Sukarev. Uh, in order to find a sub-exponential time algorithm in the discriminant of theta uh, plus factors depending on the evaluation time of theta. So that depends a little bit on your representation of your orientation. Um, and we provide a few different options and suggestions for that in this first paper. 
Okay, so in conclusion, and I guess I'm ending a little bit early, but hopefully there's questions. Uh, the cycles in the super singular L isogeny graph, we know that they enable endomorphism ring computation. And the oriented super singular L isogeny graphs cover the regular super singular L isogeny graph. And the isogeny cycles of our usual uh, super singular elliptic curve L isogeny graph are precisely the rims of oriented super singular L isogeny volcanoes. So we can completely understand cycles in our L isogeny graph by looking to the oriented picture. The behavior of the primes above L in the class group uh, of imaginary quadratic orders determines this number. So we can actually count and we provide counting information in our second paper uh, for counting isogeny cycles of a fixed length in terms of class numbers. Uh, so there's some interesting estimates that come from estimates that we also have for uh, class groups. And uh, yes, leaking information about small endomorphisms and certain classes of large endomorphisms will lead to a sub-exponential pathfinding algorithm on the super singular L isogeny graph. So it's the main takeaway from our um, two papers and our uh, Win5 collaboration on this idea. And with that, I'll say thank you. Um, sort of obligatory cat picture. <laughs> uh, take any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can just unmute and uh, ask or ask in the chat or or uh, yeah, anything you feel like. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I can uh, maybe I can start with a with a question while people are typing away. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the 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 table in in slide uh, 21 it seemed like uh, all of these endomorphisms corresponded to max no most of them correspond to maximal orders is this like uh, confidential or is this usually the case or uh well so yes that is an interesting observation i think as you increase the cycle size you'll notice um larger and larger orders appearing. It's basically a result um, based on the relationship between the class number and the cycle size. So uh, you have smaller class number for larger orders, right? Um, and there's like a proportional increase of the class number as you increase your index in the maximal order. So since I was looking at pretty small cycles i think we saw mostly pretty small uh index orders in the in the maximal order but that yeah that's probably just a sort of numbers game on that side mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting thanks mm -hmm. um, i can also ask uh, another question uh in these in these isogeny graphs you were walking along the ring but you could also walk down just in one direction in the probably maybe randomly. Is there anything that you know about what elliptic curves appear then? Do all of them appear or is this also like a cycle in some sense or? Yeah, so I'm trying to find, yeah, this picture maybe is the best one to explain. So for the two isogeny, at least your uh, rim is determined by the class group action. So you're only ever gonna have uh, two at most outgoing isogenies that are horizontal, and then the rest of them from the rim are going to be descending. Uh, and then at each altitude, you will never have horizontal isogenies here. Um, so that's basically because your order is index L in the maximal order, and you are trying to find like an ideal that'll um, transport you to another curve with the same type of orientation, it, it sort of doesn't work out with the conductor of that class group. Um, but then it is really just a copy of the usual L isogeny graph beyond that. So if I've already used uh, 1720, it's not great because it's only connected to 22, but like this J3 has a map to 171, 
Here's 171. Uh, well, 171 has maps to J3, J3 bar, and 120. So if this was already my map between 171 and J3, I know I'll have J3 bar and 120 as my two descending options. Uh, so, I mean, starting from any vertex and then descending, you'll, you'll end up eventually covering the entire L isogeny graph. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, is it uh, is it relatively easy to compute the uh, the conjugate isogeny in the oriented case? Like from what you said, basically, like meet in the middle is the only possible uh, way to find a path between two arbitrary ones of these, right? So, do you have to go through some kind of hullabaloo to to go back from the rim of the volcano down if you know the path up to the rim? Um, so wait, so the question is, is it, is the conjugate orientation hard to compute if you're given yeah. an orientation on a super singular elliptic curve? Yes. Or, well, if I have, if I have a path up to the rim, can I use that to get a path back down from the rim to the point that I was coming from? Ah, so that might relate to our, um, issue of Let's see, conjugation, um, not necessarily giving you a distinct path. So sometimes the conjugate um, of a particular oriented super singular elliptic curve uh, is isomorphic to your original orientation. So I think you would end up with backtracking or something like that if you're trying to use that to find a loop. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, can I maybe ask yet another question? That's because this the these cycles kind of uh in a way they classify like um uh one type of endomorphisms, right? Those that or in a way, I guess that those that can be can be expressed as a as a cycle. But, but for instance, if you have like a prime degree endomorphism, then this is not real. It's just a self loop, I guess. Uh, the, the, can you like classify them in any way, or it, it's maybe not? It's a bit far, maybe from what. It, what the... Yeah. Well, I guess so. If you have a prime degree endomorphism, you could see um, if you could translate it, right, and get a different an endomorphism that's sort of related but by a different uh, norm, and see that as uh, an imaginary quadrat or generating an imaginary quadratic order. Uh, yes. So it doesn't really matter, right? right okay. Yeah, you could you could use it to move around a little bit. Yeah, I think um, if I go back to that slide with the lists, um, yeah. So this sort of length five cycle here, um, the endomorphism, which I mean, we could only distinguish up to plus or minus, uh, of course, is negative one, um, doesn't do anything but basically gave us nine plus square root minus 47 over two, right? Um, and that sort of nine is, uh, I guess it's four plus the, the primitive orientation here. So yeah, you can, you can see that in order to realize that endomorphism in the two isogeny graph, you had to translate it by having a plus four or something like that. Yeah. Right. You want to think of it like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah perfect. Uh, I see. That's uh, thank you. That's very fine. Mm -hmm. Oh well. Um, if there are no more uh, questions, I think we can maybe say thank you to Sarah again and uh, and uh, finish up for today. If you feel like hanging out and uh, chatting, then uh, please just stay here and turn on your camera. And you're also allowed to leave anyone so <laughs> I'll, I'll turn off the recording
Oh, oh sorry, maybe glad to say. And be, uh, before anybody leaves, note that we also have in two weeks uh, again a session of the iSearching Club by uh, Andrea Basso on uh, OPRFs. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. But also please hang uh, if you want to chat. Yeah, because uh, well, it would be fun to talk to some of you, I guess. <laughs>